right, good evening, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. I have seven o'clock on my phone, so we will start the next session of Gardening 101. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, just a couple really quick housekeeping for some folks that might not have been on with any of our other sessions. You're automatically muted, no webinar for attend, no um, webcam for attendees. If you have questions, you can either type them in the chat box. Um, if you're doing in the chat box, just make sure you change the two to all panelists and all attendees so everybody can see them. That's a great place to generate some discussion and get um, share what works for you in your own garden as we get into this topic. Or you can type them in the Q&A. Um, I'm working off of my laptop right now, so I don't have the ability to monitor in real time, but I'll stop a couple times as we get through diseases, then pests, and then weeds, so we can catch up on questions before moving on to the next topic. So with that being said, tonight's topic is kind of a doozy. Today we're going to be talking about diseases, pests, and weeds. This is a really complicated topic. There's a reason why people will go to school to get doctorates in either diseases science, um, plant pathology, etymology, or weed science. So I want to preface this by saying there's absolutely no way we can cover every single aspect of each one of these areas. What I hope we're going to accomplish is at least hitting on the tools that will let you diagnose these issues in your own garden, perhaps recognize some of the really common diseases, pests, or weeds in your own garden, or you'll have the knowledge equipped to know when you need to ask for help if you need it. We all on this call are gardeners that have various levels of gardening experience. And in this presentation, um, we'll address chemical usage as well. Um, I know a lot of home gardeners are very, very opposed to using chemicals and are very, um, as, as are very opposed to spraying and are very focused on um, following what they feel are organic principles. So I wanna start this out by saying that even in organic farming, we use pesticides. So if you are completely opposed to using pesticides, I'm certainly not going to sway you one way or another. That is your right to garden exactly how you choose. That's the beautiful thing about gardening. But when we're dealing with these pests, sometimes it comes down to either we have to get rid of the plant or use some sort of chemical control. So we're going to delve into that a little bit deeper. What we do encourage when it comes to controlling diseases, pests, or weeds is this practice called integrated pest management or IPM. And I might talk about IPM in, in more than one way throughout the presentation. IPM is just preventing these diseases, these pests, and these weeds on the long term by managing the ecosystem, which is really a great principle when it comes to gardening, when it comes to agriculture, anytime we're growing food. So we use a combination of cultural methods, mechanical, biological and chemical in order to control these three issues that might plague our gardens. So I like to put in fun little comics. Um, if you're not familiar with the pests, um, ladybugs are natural predators of aphids, which is a big pest in, in many different species and garden plants. So the little girl thinks that she wants, she's watching them, they're calm and peaceful, but in reality, they're um, hard at work. So this is an example of a biological pest control when it comes to IPM. So what, well, what are each one of those control measures? Um, we usually try to do them in this order. So cultural happens before or you even plant or in your early stages of planting throughout the entire growing season. You might be choosing the right plants. Um, you're choosing varieties that might have some sort of disease, resi disease resistance to kind of get ahead of those problems. You're rotating plants each season in the garden. You're not putting your tomatoes in the same spot every year. You're also not putting your peppers in the same spot as your tomatoes because they're in the same plant family and susceptible to many of the same diseases and pests. Throughout the growing season, you'll probably use mechanical measures, um, handpicking those bugs as you see them. Maybe you're mulching around the base of the plants to help keep some of those soil borne diseases at bay, or maybe you're using row cover to keep some of those pests from taking hold. Um, biological kind of occurs all throughout the growing season, just encouraging those natural predators. Um, we reference IPM even when we're talking about, you know, the little critters with four legs instead of six or eight legs, um, like mice or voles or rabbits. Um, I like to tell everybody, 
I have biological pest control in my house because I have three cats. So they are a mouse control. Um, sometimes they're a vole control if they're outside. And they're also a little bit of a stink bug control. My cat likes to eat the stink bugs. And then we always say that chemicals should be your last resort only when necessary and always follow the label instructions because the label is the law. The first step when trying to diagnose any type of issue, whether it's a disease, whether it's pests, is knowing your plants. You can't be able to tell what an unplant, unhealthy plant looks like unless you understand what a healthy plant looks like. So this is an example of a raspberry plant, healthy as can be. And this is one that's having an issue with it. So if I'm not monitoring my plants daily, I might not notice that it's changing colors if I've never grown. And if I've never grown raspberries before, I might not notice that that's out of the ordinary if you're a new gardener. So making sure you know what a healthy plant's supposed to look like is gonna really help you get ahead of any disease or pest issues or even weed issues. Sometimes when plants are first sprouting, um, you kind of think, is that right? Is that a weed or did I plant that? Different varieties might look a little different than you're used to as well. So um, knowing what it's supposed to look like is a, is a huge first step. It might seem a little obvious, but that, that's the first thing we need to know. So now we're gonna talk about diseases first. Many of these diseases um, I'm gonna talk about, I tried to hit on all of the really common ones. Most of them are things that I've seen or are really prevalent in gardens in general. If I missed a few, um, that you'd like to know about, go ahead and pop them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll, we'll get around to it. So to prevent disease, it's the same principle. We have to research your plant, know their needs, and some uh, plants are more susceptible to certain diseases. With many diseases, there's the option to get disease resistant varieties. The biggest way to prevent disease is also moving your plants around that crop rotation. We've talked about it multiple times in multiple sessions throughout this program. And I can't stress how important it is. Um, and also removing plant debris from your garden. Many diseases will overwinter within the soil. And if you're leaving diseased material on the garden, um, that's just asking for trouble. You're just making sure that that disease has a nice place to be able to lie dormant in the soil. Um, or stay present in the environment and you're just increasing your risk for next year. And again, pick the best plants for your environment. That's going to be the, the easiest way to prevent long-term issues. There's a couple different things that cause disease. There's things that are living, um, fungi, nematodes, bacteria, and viruses. We, we're talking mostly about fungi and viruses. Um, throughout the diseases I mentioned, but we're also going to hit on a little bit on non-living factors that often look a lot like a disease, but aren't necessarily a disease and might be a little easier to treat. Diseases need three things in order to take hold, and we call that the disease triangle. A pathogen needs to be present. We're talking about those living things, those fungi, those viruses. That's the pathogen. The host, that's the plant, and the proper environment. Um, this might become a little clearer as we talk about a specific disease, but just throwing out an, an example, um, blossom and rot is the disease. Um, that's, that's the issue. It only presents itself in peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, species within that family, and you need the right environment. So in this case with blossom and rot, the right environment is um, lack of calcium within the plant, usually caused by infrequent watering. So if I were to break the leg of that issue, I need to, I already have the host that's present, I need to either add calcium back into the environment um, or do something to break the leg of one of these triangles. If I don't have all three of those things, I'm not going to have the disease. To control diseases, you want to monitor, um, ideally daily, sometimes it's not always possible, especially when we're in the busy season of gardening life, but on a regular basis, checking your plants for signs and symptoms. Um, again, if you can get that pathogen-free material, sometimes it's healthy transplants or sometimes it's um, disease, cert certified disease-free seed, either one of those is fine. 
Um, you can prevent it by, again, crop rotation, crop rotation, crop rotation. Um, mulching helps a lot too. Some diseases um, are present in the soil. As it rains, the soil splashes on the leaves and that's how it transmits to the plant. That's a way to prevent that as well. And taking actions to not only manage the disease when you see it, but also control it from spreading and preventing it as possible. Sometimes that may be, we're coming down to that last point in IPM, that chemical control. But other times it might be, there's no hope for that plant. We just need to remove it. So now I'm gonna talk about a few very specific diseases. Um, these are, I think I put them in alphabetical order, but if they're a little off, that's fine. And again, if I don't cover one that you're interested in knowing about, I can't promise to know all the answers with all diseases because I don't have a PhD in plant pathology, but I can do my best to either find that answer for you or um, someone on the call might also have experience with that specific disease that I don't have. Anthracnose. Anthracnose is a disease. Um, it's a fungus that's caused by wet conditions. You'll start to notice a pattern with many of these diseases. They usually need funguses. Think of them when you leave bad food out on the counter. Um, they might need a wet or humid or hot condition to be able to thrive. And that's the case with many of these diseases as well. Anthracnose can present itself in many different plants. Um, it's common in trees, it's common in shrubbery. This is an example of what it looks like in peppers. So a prevention or a treatment for this specific disease might be mulching, um, removing the infective fruits, and making sure your area is sanitized, removing that plant debris. When I say sanitation, that's what I mean, either sanitizing your tools or sanitizing your garden. And blossom end rot. Um, this is one that affects, in this uh, high tunnel situation, it was tomatoes, it also affects peppers and others within that family. Blossom end rot is actually a calcium deficiency. It's usually caused by infrequent watering. The plant is either not taking, is not taking up enough calcium from the soil. Sometimes your soil just doesn't have enough calcium, but usually it's because the watering is not regular. Um, and if you think about periods where we have heavy drought than heavy rain, that might be an example when watering is irregular. So if you find yourself in those conditions, making sure those plants have enough water, checking your soil and nutrient levels. Um, there's kind of uh, an old wives tale where folks will say they pour a gallon of milk next to their tomatoes or their peppers that have signs of this disease or they put powdered milk in the soil. Um, that's giving, certainly giving the plants a boost to calcium, but it's really not addressing the underlying issue. It might solve the problem for that particular plant, but it's not solving the issue that led it to have blossom and rot. Bacterial wilt. Um, this one is common in cucurbits, so the cucumber family. And this is an example of disease that's commonly transmitted by cucumber beetles. So you'll see some of these things kind of correlate with each other. Prevention. Um, or treatment with this is managing the cucumber beetle, which we'll get into in the pesticides, and there's some resistant varieties available. But this is an example of what a severe case might look like. Wilt is caused when the plant's not getting enough water, so it starts to look really sad. Um, and this specific disease um, is, is present in, in the cucumber family. Black leg. This is one um, that you'll see in cabbages and other cold crops like broccoli, kales, and cauliflowers. Um, it's a soil-borne fungus. This particular fungus also causes dampening off in seedlings. If you participated in Bethel seed starting, she talked about dampening off, which is when your environment's a little too wet um, and your seedlings just don't look healthy at all. They get really spindly on, on the stems um, and then the stems kind of actually get all mushy and the seedling just kind of doesn't do well from there. Um, so this is the same type of soil borne fungus. There's disease free seed you can purchase. Um, there's also fungicides. And with this particular issue, um, making sure you have enough air space between your plants. So if you have enough airflow, um, that helps keep things moving and keeps the disease from, from taking hold. And again, um, sanitation, if, if this is a soil-borne fungus, if you're using seed starting trays, making sure they're sanitized, making sure residues that disease infected is out of the garden, all of those tips will help keep you from having an issue, um, hopefully in the next year. Black rot. 
This one is grapes. Um, several of these pictures, I've taken some of them that you'll see things and um, attributes on the, on the bottom. I did not take those pictures. So you can see how some of them are even found here, here locally in the panhandle. Um, black rot is a fungal disease. Again, that warm, humid weather. It's really common with grapes. And again, this is one that's resi resistant varieties um, in fruit, especially small fruit. Um, there's a lot of preventative measures we take to keep them from having these sort of issues and um, preventative measures for black rots is, is one that's advised and sanitation. You can see the berries turn um, mummified is, is the proper term for it, but they're black and they look super gross. Uh, you'd want to prune that cane out. If you saw that in your own vineyard, your, your own grapevines, you're going to want to prune that out so it's not spreading to other other parts of the, the plants that you might have. Candace last week touched on cedar apple rust. Um, this is one that we see all the time. And this fungi needs two different hosts. It needs um, something in the rose family, which includes apples. We most commonly see it on apples. Um, and something in the juniper family. It might be a cedar tree um, and it might be a juniper tree. Um, Removing hosts is not always the easiest way to prevent that because the disease can travel up to a mile. Um, so if your neighbor's got the junipers, that's not always the easiest thing to tell them, hey, you need to cut those down because I'm, it's, it's making my apple trees pretty ugly. This one really creeps me out because it just looks really ugly. It kind of looks like an alien life form. But with these fruit diseases, um, there are preventative sprays you can take in a home orchard setting that the home owner can buy, usually copper-based fungicides, that will help um, keep this disease from, from plaguing your trees. Downy mildew is one that's also really common. Again, you'll see that wet or very humid conditions, there's quite a pattern here. And what do we have sometimes when we have really heavy rains and in the very heat of summer, wet and humid conditions. So it's no surprise that these come up in the garden setting. Prevention with these resistant varieties, um, proper spacing, anything that needs wet conditions to thrive that's a fungus, you gotta have proper spacing that requires proper, that gives you proper airflow between the plants and it, it helps um, prevent it before it even becomes an issue. And again, with many things, there's resistant varieties, but there's also fungicides to help prevent it which are more common in a commercial setting where you know, livelihoods are depending on these crops. Early blight, um, there's two different types of blight tomatoes, early blight and late blight. Early blight's much more common. Late blight, they, they have similar symptoms, but we're only gonna talk about early blight. Again, another one, warm temps, high humidity to spore, causes these lesions not only on the fruit of the plant, but on the leaves of the plant itself. Um, there's also some discoloration on the stem there are resistant varieties. Um, many of you might be tomato growers and you'll notice that. Crop rotation is another really key one. Um, this is one that's in the soil and with rain, the soil splashes onto the leaves and that's how the fungus might infect the plant. So mulching helps keep the soil from splashing up. And then there's fungicides. Um, again, late blight is another one, but it's, it's pretty uncommon. But within the past couple of years, it has been detected in the panhandle. Um, when you have an issue with um, early blight, um, fungicides are a preventative treatment. When you find early blight, it's usually best to just pull the plants out. There's not much you can do to get the poor buddy coming back from this. And then you keep it from spreading to other plants. Mosaic virus. Now there's a few different types of mosaic virus. There is um, tobacco mosaic virus, there's tomato mosaic virus, and cucumber mosaic virus. This picture was taken from a pumpkin that had cucumber mosaic virus. Um, the virus can be transmitted by wind, it can be transmitted by workers, tools, or even pests. In this case, um, this was located in Jefferson County, and I, like I said, it's pumpkins. Um, it was transmitted by pests. And actually that's just by a plant pathologist, that was just speculation. We had no way of actually knowing that, but we knew the grower had taken every step possible to keep it from being transmitted by other ways. So that was just really our best guess. Um, with cases like tobacco mosaic virus, um, 
It can be transmitted if you have, if you're a smoker and you get it on your hands and then you go work in the garden. Or if you are, um, then touch the tools, it can be transmitted that way. So sanitizing your hands, sanitizing yourself, sanitizing your tools can keep these viruses from spreading. They spread a lot differently than, than the, the um, diseases that might be caused by fungi compared to viruses. You can get disease-free seed and plants for some of those mosaic viruses. Um, and then if you have a pest issue, controlling for the pests. What this particular cucumber mosaic virus is what's pictured, you can see the leaf does not look normal. You're kind of getting this modeling on the leaf. Um, if you didn't know anything about pumpkins, you might think like, oh, this is a cool new variety and this is just how it's supposed to go. Um, the fruit itself, if the, the plant was, had put out some fruit that was normal and then the plant got infected and then put out more fruit after that, the fruit that set after the plant was infected also looked really warty. Um, and again, if you didn't know any better, you might think that it's just kind of cool. I mean, these were just ornamental pumpkins. Um, so what better way to have a plant infected in 2020 than with a virus that just makes it look all kinds of weird. Powdery mildew. Um, this one is such a beast. I've come out, I've checked on my garden the night before, it's perfectly fine. And then it seems like two days later, you walk out and like everything's infected with powdery mildew. Um, this one needs cooler temps and that high humidity to spore. Um, and again, it seemingly appears overnight. There are fungicides. Um, and then you can also, the, the best way for this is improving that air circulation, making sure you have proper spacing between the plants. Um, so the water, you want the water to be able to dry off of the leaves because that's where the fungus lies. And you can see it on, on the leaves here in this picture from Ohio State. Scurf. Um, this is one specifically for sweet potatoes. And this is a soil borne fungus that only appears because of lack of crop rotation. Um, these potatoes from this home grower were grown in the same spot for multiple years. And that's the reason why they had scurf. Uh, our advice to this grower was you need to put your potatoes in a different spot every year. And that location where you had these potatoes infected with scurf don't come back to it for at least three years. Give the soil time to get that fungus out of its system before you come back with the sweet potatoes. So this could have been prevented with crop rotation. Um, in that case, the grower didn't know. Um, there might not have been another space for them to, to rotate their crops or it might have been difficult, but it's all about education and making sure we don't have this issue in the future. These almost felt like a football. Like they were very... Um, leathery and it, it just didn't feel right. Oh, I forgot to put the extra causes on septoria leaf spot. Um, this is another fungus that needs, I believe, the, the wet human conditions. Um, fungicides, removing plant debris, those are all control measures to keep the leaf spot from, from taking hold. Um, I don't see this one as much as some of the other ones, but it's still prevalent. That's um, tomato that you see infected there. Vermiculum wilt. Um, this one is also, you'll see this in, in some tomatoes. This is another soil bone fungus. Um, and basically what happens is it prevents water to flow to the plant and it causes the wilting of the plant. You can see that plant is not looking healthy at all. Um, another reason, crop rotation, resistant varieties. And when, when you see issues get to this stage, Sometimes it's better to just remove the plant um, and, and move on. You wanna keep it from spreading. Sometimes if you see it at one plant, you can keep it from spreading to, to other subsequent plants. And you catch it in time. So now that brings us to things, I'm gonna stop because I do see something in the chat. Barbara asks, what do you re recommend mulching with? Great question, Barbara. Um, everybody uses something different. Some folks will use black plastic. Some folks will use red plastic. The downside of those, um, you have to rip them up. There's, there's varieties that are biodegradable. People report mixed reviews with them. I know the folks at the WV Research Front have used it with mixed success. Um, you can mulch with paper, newspaper, cardboard. Um, I'm not a big fan of newspaper because you gotta pour so much water on it just to get it to keep it from blowing away everywhere. 
Um, we in my garden, we're mulching with wood chips this year for the first time. Uh, we got a wood chipper for the farm. So we were just cleaning some brush around the house and have a nice big pile of wood chips to, to help out with that. Um, if neither of those are an option, straw, not hay. Hay has the seed heads in it and you might end up with a weed problem. But straw is just the stem of the plant and um, it's, it might be hard to find. You might pay a little bit more for it than you would if you were feeding it to your animals. Uh, but you shouldn't need a whole lot to be able to cover a small garden space. Um, I would definitely recommend straw. That's what my, my, my sister and my brother-in-law use that. They have great success with that. Um, but we're using wood chips just because that's what we have on hand. And again, you can get big rolls of black plastic. The thicker ones are a lot easier to work with. They actually have lines already on the plastic that you can punch holes in. They're a little easier to roll up at the end of the growing season too. Or you could leave it on your garden too. And um, keep the soil covered, you're keeping it from eroding away if you're not doing a cover crop or doing anything else on, on the garden space. So that brings us to a few things um, that are not quite a disease. And again, if you have any specific questions about diseases we didn't cover, pop them in the chat box, we'll, we'll get over to them. But there's a few things that you look at when you look at your plant and think, that doesn't look quite right. Something's killing that plant. But that doesn't always mean it's a disease. This one, um, I don't know a lot of people that have issues with this in a garden setting unless we have like a huge monsoon season, which is not unusual because we definitely had one in 2018. I had this problem when I first started growing houseplants because I just loved them too hard. But any plant can be susceptible to, for root rot and the causes is just simply overwatering. Um, too much moisture in the soil, you're flooding the roots, they can't uptake anymore, the plant doesn't need anymore. So with too much water, they're gonna drop, they're gonna die. So this is an example of strawberries that have good root development um, with the proper moist soil moisture and one that's been watered too much. Um, mulching is also good, not only to help disease and to help weed pressure, um, but it also helps with this too because it retains soil moisture. You think if you're putting that layer on top of it, um, the top layer of the soil is not drying out because it's not exposed to the sun. So um, in those dry periods through the summer that we all naturally go through, you might not need to water as frequently or as much because you have that layer that's helping retain the moisture. And there are several nutrients that your, your plant's trying to tell you the, it's deficient in a nutrient um, but it might look like a disease or that something's wrong with it. So I'm going to hit on just a few really common ones. Um, nitrogen deficiency. Nitrogen is the most needed element by the plants. Um, we know its importance, but some crops are very heavy nitrogen users like corn. So they might tell you that they need more. And usually you'll look at the leaves for that, for that sign. Every plant doesn't show symptoms in the same way, um, but most of them do. So some plants might show nitrogen efficiency a little bit differently, um, but this is a good rule of thumb to follow. So you'll see yellowing all through the center of the leaf. Um, you're looking at the leaf vein right in the middle and the yellowing is going around the vein where the edges are remaining green for the most part. Potassium deficiency looks exactly the opposite. It's yellow around the perimeter of the leaf. Um, sometimes it might look a little bit burnt or a little bit orange on the very, very edges like you see in this picture. And phosphorus deficiency looks completely different than either one of those. It actually shows purpling around the edge of the leaf. Um, grasses are big users of phosphorus. Grasses are almost always deficient in phosphorus. Um, I see the proof when I get soil tests back for lawns or people are testing pastures. So if you go look um, wandering through your own yard when things start to green up, you might actually notice that um, the grass has purple on it. And once you can see it, you probably can't unsee it. And it's just the grass telling you that it might need a little bit of phosphorus. So if you're the type of person that's really concerned about a lush green lawn, that's gonna be an indicator you might need to get a soil test done. Manganese um, is yellowing spots between the veins of the leaf. So this was a, a um, greenhouse grower 
that was having a manganese issue. Um, he was buying manufactured soil, so it wasn't in, in the ground. And that's what the, the leaf is trying to tell us. Um, this hadn't gotten too far back, but you can, you can see the discoloration. All right, so I get this question all the time, especially in the height of growing season. What is killing my plant? If you wanna answer that question for yourself or you want your county agent to help you answer it, it really helps to be able to tell us what type of plant do you have? What's killing a tomato is gonna to be a lot different than what's killing a corn plant or what's killing a lettuce. Where is the damage? Are you seeing it on the leaves? Is it on the stem? Is it on the fruit? Is it on a combination of all three? Um, that goes back to being able to tell us what does a healthy plant look like? So you can tell us what does an unhealthy plant look like? So you know something's wrong with that leaf, not normal, I need to look into that. What are the symptoms? Again, explaining how does it differ from a healthy plant? Well, I'm seeing lesions on the leaves. I'm seeing water soaked spots on the fruit. Um, the plant itself is wilting. The plant itself is not even producing fruit. What are the issues? That helps us diagnose if the problem could be a disease, maybe it's something environmental, or maybe it's something else. And then this helps you be able to tell us if you know what type of diseases your plant are susceptible to, you might be able to do the research yourself. Um, if you know you don't have a disease resistant variety of tomato, well, then that just opens up the whole world of tomato diseases for you. But if you know that your disease, your plant is supposed to have been bred to have a resistance to early blight, you might be able to start ruling that out and look at other factors instead. So if you're looking for some answers to that question that helps us narrow down, is it weather? Is it nutrients? We're always gonna default to those two things first um, because sometimes that is just the issue. Your plant's not getting enough water. Maybe it's too hot and the blossoms aren't setting properly and that's why the plant's not fruiting. We had that problem, really extreme heat for a long period of time. will cause tomato flowering to be delayed. Um, then we'll start looking at those different living factors. And sometimes it comes down to it looks like a disease it acts like a disease in your, in your mind and what it looks like, but it might be a pest. Um, so it's a living thing, but it's not necessarily a disease. But sometimes pest damage can look like it could be a disease. Couple questions catching up in the chat. Chuck um, has a good point. I introduced multiple rows and tree of heaven in my blueberries by using wood chips. So he's battling those. Yes, yes, it does help if you know like where the wood chips came from um, and what was ground up from it. So very good point, Chuck. Thanks for that. It, hel it helps to know your source. Um, Paul is asking, should I avoid pine mulch? Um, I don't know the question to the, if oak mulch contains tannins that will change soil conditions. I don't know that, Paul. Pine mulch, could alter the pH, it would be good practice to use it in more of acid loving things. But I would just recommend if you're using pine mulch to test your soil regularly to make sure that it's not altering the pH. And if it is, you're able to remedy that. At the end of the growing season is the great time to do that. Um, it takes a while for anything that you're putting into the soil to truly alter the pH a lot. So if you're putting it, using a mulch in the, for the summertime and testing in the fall, you should be able to catch that and counteract it. I wouldn't be extremely worried about it changing a whole lot. Our pH in the Eastern Panhandle tends to run high. In fact, sometimes people, um, growers apply sulfur because it's too high. It runs over seven when we want it to be six to 6.8, dependent on the crop you're trying to grow. So sometimes lowering the pH isn't, so, isn't the worst thing in the world. But regular soil test is the best way to monitor that. Now we're gonna talk about pests. Um, this was the grossest picture. I'm not a big bug fan, um, if you can't tell, but I don't mind collecting the samples. People, you would bring me bugs and they'll bring it to you in like a sour cream container. You can't see inside it. So you just don't know what you're getting yourself into. If you're gonna bring me a bug, please bring it to me in a glass jar. I like to know what I'm getting into from, from the get-go. This was a larger field, nothing you probably ever see in your backyard. Um, this was on sorghum. 
Um, it's thousands and thousands of aphids mm. on sorghum. Um, we'll cover that here. The impact of pest damage, why do we want to control for, for pests? Um, as you just learned in the disease portion, pests can carry disease. Those cucumber beetles um, can, can carry disease and infect your plant and lose your whole crop. Um, when pests, like in this image of the cabbage, feed on various parts of the plant, it affects the flow of water and nutrients. The plant suddenly has to direct its energy to putting out new leaves if it's having an issue and less energy on setting the food that we actually want to eat. And if really heavy feeding will impact the growth of plants. A rule of thumb we use when looking for pest damage is if more than 30% of the leaf or the area is being defoliated, that's the time it becomes a problem. There's always exceptions to that. There's always pests that don't necessarily feed on the leaf, but when we think of pest sandwich, that's usually the first thing that comes to mind. 30%, um, that's hard to gauge when the holes are spread all across the, the leaves, um, but you can do your best judgment there. So just like the diseases, we're gonna go through several pests. Um, aphids, like you saw in that really beautiful picture of the, um, the sorghum. There's many different types of aphids, different ones feed on different types of plants. Um, you'll notice they feed on the leaves, they're usually present in high numbers and it can cause stunted growth of the plant. Um, prevention on the insecticide side, um, you can use neem oil or help smother them out. It keeps, it keeps, it smothers the leaf, which is what they feed on so they don't have a food source. And there's also encouraging natural lady enemies like ladybugs, like in that beautiful comic I showed you on, on the third slide or so. Going back to that first image on the pest interest slide, the aphids, when they feed on the plants, um, especially this type of aphid, they kind of secrete a honeydew from the, the plants. So you can see that's um, a heavily infested dew, dew leaf versus one that's um, almost been untouched. It's um, some of the sugars are gone on the plant. This plant was gonna be used for um, feed for cattle. So the plant's not necessarily like lost, um, the concern with this producer was that when he went in to harvest it, would all of that sticky residue hurt his machinery? Um, so that, that was the main concern there. Um, so aphids, not necessarily doing lasting damage, but obviously they're unsightly. If you're feeding on something like your lettuce or your spinach, obviously I don't want to eat something that just had a bunch of bugs on it. So those are some of the reasons why you might want to control that. Cabbage looper. Um, feeds on the cold crops, the cabbages. The larvae feed on the leaves. The adults might feed on the nectar with the different plants. Um, good preventative for that. There are some, some varieties that have a resistance to cabbage looper. Um, row cover helps disrupt that. You have two different life stages of this particular pest. So that's another reason why we, we want to pay attention to pests because not it doesn't always mean that every life state cycle is harmful. Um, the moth is not as harmful as the worm because they are in two different forms. Um, there are insecticides you can use to, to combat this one as well. Um, we'll talk about proper use of those at the very, very end, but that's what they look like. Cucumber beetles. Um, this one, this is, this is more than 30% defoliation of the flower. There's, there's striped cucumber beetles and there's spotted cucumber beetles. The larva of these ones, um, again, going to those different life stages in the life cycle, the larva feed on the roots, but the adults feed on the blossoms like you see here. And they also carry diseases like we talked about earlier. Um, a good way for cucumber beetles is, is keeping the garden clean, um, combating with pesticides and routine monitoring and disrupting their life cycle in, in some way. With many of really common pests, there's traps you can use um, to determine how many, kind of get a feel on the, what the population is. In certain crops, we have threshold recommendations on when you catch this many traps, this many in your trap within a day, a week, uh, or a certain time period, that's when you might want to use um, insecticides as a control measure. That's, that's a, a reasonable threshold where we can say it's doing harm. Flea beetle is another one. Um, it damages the, the, the crops by feeding on the leaves and stems. 
Um, you can trap these. There's like little sticky traps that can be used in this one. Um, flea beetle is pretty common in eggplants one that you'll see. Their holes are teeny, teeny, tiny too as well. So it, it differs from a few other ones. And because the, the beetles are so dark, it makes them a little easier to find than aphids. Um, there's row covers that can be used. There's different insecticides as well um, to control that as well. Uh, People have had various success with sticky traps. Um, it just kind of depends on, on your population levels as well. Everybody's favorite, the Japanese beetle. They will feed on the leaves and kind of skeletonize the leaf like that. So then the plant's got to expel all that energy. Um, hand picking is, there's some insecticides for it. Um, there's kind of an old wives tale treatment where you can drown them in soapy water and just shake them. Same for the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, let them rot and helps deter other ones that might come, come into the area. Um, but they feed on the leaves. They haven't been as bad in recent years. I haven't noticed them as many. Oh, I see the stink bugs all over the place though. I just flicked one out of my office earlier today. I thought that they would be all be dead by now. Spider mites. Uh, this is one of the first pests I got when I was an extension agent. I didn't really know what I was looking for. And then I found it and I realized what it was. And my first thought was, I really wish I hadn't put this in my office floor because you just feel like they're crawling all over you. These things are teeny, teeny, tiny. We usually use a microscope to be able to find them, but you can tell if they're there because it's gonna start looking like they're sucking the chlorophyll out of the leaves, like in that bottom picture. Um, so that's obviously gonna do some damage to the plant. Um, spider mites can be a pretty big problem in house plants as well, if anybody has any of those, um, and they can spread pretty easily. Um, neem oil is, is one that helps, um, again, they're feeding on the leaf, you're coating the leaf, so you're removing their ability to feed on something. And then there's some natural enemies that, that prey on those as well. I throw this one in here. Um, this is corn. Um, monitoring a field of corn in the panhandle for slug damage, because this is a really good example of monitoring a crop and using that information, that hands-on visual information to determine, is this pest a big enough problem that we can justify spraying? So we were walking across the field, we were picking out the, the leaves were very, very short at this stage, um, trying to look for signs of slug damage if we found so much slug damage every 10 plants we inspected, you know, if every plant we inspected looked like this, we would tell the farmer, okay, it's probably best that you think about applying a, a, an insecticide to, to control these here. Um, we didn't find a, few, uh, a whole lot. So we were able to tell the farmer, you know, with the, the slugs are here, but with the amount of damage they're causing, your plants are gonna be fine. Your plants are gonna outgrow the damage that the slugs are doing to them. So it's not worth your time, your money, or the environmental impact to spray anything. Another way you can get around pests like these is timing of planting. Um, if pests come out at certain times, so by adapting the planting schedule to either be earlier, if possible, sometimes it's not always possible, or later, which usually we can get around with, um, depending on when you plan to harvest the plant, is we can kind of work around those different life cycles and have a little bit better control over if it's gonna be an issue or not that growing season. Squash bugs, this is a good example. I, this is the best example I have to show you on different life cycles. Um, I took all these pictures on the same day. So they feed on the leaves as well hand picking and pesticides. Um, in this particular garden setting, this was with the community gardens in Ranson. They were just hand picking. The population wasn't that bad. Um, it, was, it was enough that they could justify spending a little bit of time just smushing the eggs so they're not hatching. So that's the egg stage of the life cycle. Um, that's the next stage. There's certain things, instars, first instar, I don't, I, I'm not going to pretend like I know all the technical terms, but then that's the adult. So all three of these were present at the same time. I think this was around July, so really heat of when we're really monitoring for pests and trying to control them. Um, so even the one life cycle, it, it doesn't necessarily mean just because we're past a certain time period, you're still going to see the eggs, you're still going to see 
um, the nymphs and you're still gonna see the adults just because of, of the flow of the environment at the time. And this is squash vine borer. Um, this was also taken the same day at the community gardens. The vine borers um, overwinter in the soil. You might see evidence of them around the base of the plant, but they literally bore up into the stem of um, squashes. So pumpkins, um, winter squash, summer squash, anything. And they will kill the plants when they get that far. Um, you'll hear folks talking about when they see signs of them performing surgery on the plant, they slice the stem of the plant, they're taking the borer out, and then they're mounding up soil around it to try and get the plant to heal itself. You got about a 50-50 shot of that actually doing anything. Um, when it comes to this plant, there's really not a lot of insecticides you can use to control it. Um, monitoring the plant, mulching around the base of the plant, row cover at the time they're starting to come out late June, early July, after the plant is flowered, and then crop rotation is really important here too. Um, because they overwinter in the soil, rotating the crops, you're, you're ensuring that if I put my squash there next year, I already know I got the squash vine borer. Why would I do that to myself? It was a big problem last year. It's gonna be a big problem this year because I'm just giving it the host plant. Putting something that's not affected by the vine borer helps disrupt that life cycle. And tomato hornworm, um, everybody likes this one. They actually look kind of cute if they didn't do so much damage. They feed on the leaves and the stem of tomatoes and other plants in the tomato family. Hand picking, you got little kids, this is the best, best job for them. And encouraging natural enemies. These things are big. Once you find them, they're a little easy to pick off. Um, on the natural enemies point, there's a type of wasp that lays its eggs on the tomato hornworm. And as the eggs hatch, they feed on the hornworm and they kill it. So if you ever see one look like this, it's, do, it's nature doing its work. So just leave it alone um, and let it do its work. Same thing with what is killing my plant. You're asking what is eating my plant? Goes back to the same principles. I can't stress on them enough. What part of the plant is abnormal? What part of the plant is damaged? Fruit, leaves, stem, maybe a combination of all three. What kind of damage do you see? Um, you might see the little chewing holes that are indicate insects. Um, you might see, if we're talking tree fruit, you might see holes within the fruit that indicate something's boring in it. If you see entire leaves, entire tomatoes, entire roses, ears of corn missing on the plant, maybe the cute little groundhog that lives under your shed like it lives under mine, likes to come out and just take one bite out of your squash and then goes back in his hole for the next night until the next one flowers and gets ready to be picked. That's an indication of animal damage and not necessarily pest damage. So that's all one other presentation that we have at the, the very last one is on critter control, which is promising to be extremely useful for anybody that's got a garden. So again, being able to communicate what's wrong helps us narrow down what the issues could be and how you might be able to treat it. But bugs don't always mean bad. Just because we see bugs doesn't necessarily mean that they're all trying to do harm for our plants. Here's a few examples. On these eggplants, ladybugs, you got the honeybee, you got the ladybugs, lightning bugs. This little monster, uh, I see Mary Beth was on. I took this little guy, someone brought him into my office and I took him to a master gardener class that afternoon. We had lunch together. This is a grub for a Hercules beetle. Those things are massive. And I'm not, again, I'm not a big bug person, but yeah, this thing, this thing is like, the, I don't know, this big, it's huge. Um, but it's a beneficial insect and that's what the grub looks like. So the one stage before it goes into turning into the beetle. And then this was a type of ant that was a beneficial, um, lives underground. I can't recall the name of it. If anybody knows, feel free to shoot that over to me. But um, again, looks kind of scary. Looks like not something, looks like something that might sting you. But when we did a little research to find out what it was, we found out it was beneficial. So these are just a few of the top 10 um, beneficial insects. I can't promise to know a whole lot of information about them, just some pictures of what they look like. So you can recognize them in your own gardens. The lace wing bug, 
Many of these are predators of the non-beneficial insects as well. So if you see these in your garden, you definitely want to encourage them. The assassin bug, um, you got the little wheel on the back. The minute py pirate bug. They're not very like super creative with names in the entomology world. The big eyed bug, that one's cute. The damsel bug, surfed fly, the ground beetle. And the ladybug, not the Asian ladybug, the, the regular ladybug. And then the honeybee. So all these little guys, there's plenty more. We could, again, get a four-year college degree in entomology and, and learn about these all day long. But this is your crash course in entomology here. So I'll take a break. I see I got a couple points in the chat. Let me catch up, catch up on these. Mary asks, is it okay to rotate the location of my tomato plants every year and use the same location on alternate years, but I do not see specific disease issues. Yes, you want to alternate um, ideally on a three or four year rotation. However, that is not always possible. Um, so anytime you can introduce a different crop family in there, Mary, um, maybe if you're doing squashes and tomatoes and lettuces, that gives you an extra year, but those cultural control measures, um, the mulching, the routine monitoring, disease-free material can all take steps to help you see, from seeing any issues and encouraging any of those disease, um, diseases to really take hold in the soil. And Stefan asked, my wife keeps seeing articles that cicadas are coming this year and forces were in the yeah, that, that is a really good point. Um, you know, I probably should have thrown that in there with the cicadas, but the 17 year cicadas are coming out this year. Woo! Um, I'm not going to tell you how old I was last time they came out, but it was traumatizing. Um, I do not like it at all, but they um, live underground and they come out every 17 years and broods about Four, five years ago, they came out um, in the majority of the state. So where I'm from, I'm from Tyler County. So they were, they were out in Tyler County in full force in the Northern Panhandle along the Ohio River Valley in the central part of the state. The Southern part of the state saw an emergence um, just a couple years ago, and now it's our turn in the Eastern Panhandle. Aren't we so lucky? Um, they will defoliate your leaves um, I haven't done a whole lot on their impacts in the garden. Everything that I've heard says that the damage they will do is purely superficial. They might eat leaves, which might, of course, impact the health of your plants. Um, the emphasis is more on if you're planning on planting a new fruit tree. Now's probably not going to be the best year to do it. Or if you are, Covering those newer trees with a netting helps keep them from feeding on it. I hope that information helps. Row cover, um, Kathleen asked about row cover. Is it this a fabric type of cover or something else? So row cover is usually a fabric. It's usually something you can reuse. Um, there's different weights of row cover. If you're using a row cover as um, to, to warm the environment underneath the plant, you might get a heavier weight. Like if you were wanting to plant lettuce out early and keep it in the ground late um, and use it as a sort of season extension to keep the air on underneath that area warm, you'd want to get a thicker weight. If you're just using it as a pest control me measure, there's light weights of row cover and they're usual, usually um, permeable with water. So when it rains, it'll still allow the plant to get some water as well. It just doesn't so much um, allow the pests to get in. Um, we're working on getting a squash vine borer project um, on a couple farms this year. So that's one method we were looking at testing is how well the row cover keeps them at bay. That's something that you read all over. That's advice for home gardeners. After the plant flowers and it's pollinated, so you know it's gonna set fruit using the row cover to, to keep those those uh, um, adults from from harming the plant. So yeah, you can get it from any garden supply store. Um, for for insects, though, you want it to be a lightweight because in the heat of summer, you're not wanting to cover these plants. 
and then it becoming too hot underneath of the plant. Okay, so weeds. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on weeds. Um, I'm gonna hit on a few that are really, really common um, and how to best control them. But the main principles of weeds controlling, it's, it's a lot, sounds a lot easier than it actually is in practice. But a, a main point I wanna make is that a weed is just a plant that's not valued with its growing. What is a weed to me might not be a weed to you. A dandelion to many people is a weed, but to a lot of more of us, we see it as the first food for pollinators. Some people make wine out of it. Um, maybe you, you've got kids or grandkids that like to pick them in your yard and give you a beautiful bouquet of flowers. To some people, it's not a weed. But when they're in our garden setting, they're usually weeds if we don't want them there. We have two different types of weeds. We have annuals and we have perennials. Annuals are maturing in one season. They're usually faster growing. The best way to control them is usually before they flower. Um, you can still control them after, way, but after they flower, but the best way is to control them before. And they usually produce a lot of seeds because they're up, they're out, and they're like, we are gonna do our whole life here in the next three months. So we wanna make sure we leave a legacy and that legacy is a lot of seeds. But you also have perennials. They live for multiple seasons. They can be a lot harder to control. You usually need to kill the roots to kill the actual plant. And they also produce a lot of seeds. So isn't that just beneficial for all of us? Um, we've, we've made such a business out of getting these weeds out of our lawns, out of our gardens, out of our crop fields, that it's no wonder they've become so hardy and so hard to control. I have what I call a native plant habitat in my yard, meaning I don't control the weeds in my yard. I could care less if they're there. I value what they have to offer and the diversity that they show me. And in my garden, I don't want them anywhere in sight. These weeds can be also two different types, which helps control how we control them. Broadleaf, um, a broadleaf plant your, and your weeds, they're things like your, your dead nettle and your dandelions. But then you also have your grasses, um, your Johnson grass and your Jimson, not Jimson, your Japanese stilt grass. Um, that, that does influence how they grow um, and more influences how we're able to control them. If you're not opposed to using chemical control on weeds, you'll have herbicides that are selective, meaning they might kill just that species but more often than not, what we find on the homeowner side is they're either going to kill broadleaf plants or they're going to kill grass plants. If I am spraying my yard for something that's going to kill broadleaf plants, I'm also going to kill the clover because it is a broadleaf plant too. So I hope that helps distinguish between the two. We also have biennials in the plants, which they mature. They usually take two growing seasons. Um, Mary covered that in the flower section. Um, you, they also can be classified as not so hardy perennials if you want to get specific. So we want to control weeds because they compete with our wanted plants for light, nutrients, water, and space. And they also can bring unwanted diseases and unwanted pests. So it's, it's just as simple, guys. Just to control your weeds, just to eliminate the open space, right? A lot easier said than done, but that's what it ultimately comes down to. What you have to decide is how are you going to eliminate that open space? I like this comment because I identify with it on a very personal level because we have a lot of weeds in our yard. I don't really care about what the yard looks like. Um, diversity, it's all good. This guy's got the same opinion. Here's a few different really common types of weeds, when you might expect to see them and what types of treatments um, and other, some of their other interesting uses as well. So maybe if you have this, you won't see it as a weed if you have another use for it. Chickweed um, is one, we see this all in horse pastures, but we'll also see it in lawns and gardens. Um, it's a winter biennial. So it usually goes through its life cycle in two different seasons. If you don't have a huge infestation of it, the roots are quite shallow. So it's easier to hand remove it. Um, 
a lot of people will actually use this as a salad green, an herb, or medicinal uses. Please don't ask me what those medicinal uses are. I'm not very well versed in that. I'm sure someone, someone out here might be. Um, so if you, if you want to enlighten me, I'd really appreciate that. Um, I only know that you can make wine and jelly out of dandelions, and people like to eat the leaves on those too. Um, chickweed's flowering right about now, so you might start seeing, seeing some of those if you have it in, in your yard. Since it's a winter um, biannual, we usually see the growth of those in the cooler months. So they might start growing in the fall, and they're going to flower and grow again in the spring. And then their growth is going to slump off in the summer, because we have plenty of summer annuals that will take care of that. Crabgrass. I hate crabgrass. I have, I have a crabgrass problem. Um, this is a summer annual, and this is so hard to pull. Um, the best way to prevent it is by mulching, keeping it suppressed, because when they, it emerges, it's so teeny tiny, you, it's really hard to grab it. Um, and the root system on this is, is very, very hardy, despite being an annual. So mulching and maintaining it, if it's in a lawn setting, maintaining a desirable turf, and then treating it with herbicides if you just can't get a handle on it. Um, I have not had luck finding many that are good to use in a garden setting because most of the herbicides are for lawn setting and the, the um, expectation is that you're not gonna be producing food in that space. So if you have a problem with this in your garden, like I do, hence my pile of wood chips in the backyard, um, that, that'd be the way I would go if, you, if you're in the same boat as me. Dead nettle. Dead nettle starting to flower right now as well. I used to pick little bouquets of this. I always thought this was a, a quite a, a cute little flower. It's a winter annual, so it starts to grow in the fall and slumps off low day lights, um, low temperatures, low amount of light during the winter time, and you're going to start see, seeing the flower right about now. If this is a weed you want to control. Um, this one is not one that really needs to be sprayed because it's not a very hardy weed. A light tillage and getting rid of the bare spots where it was is enough to really break up the seed bank and control it. Um, and this one has medicinal properties as well. Fun little fact. This one, um, probably many people have it, especially if it be, you have any shady spot in your area, is ground ivy. It's also called Creeping Charlie. Um, it's a perennial. You can hand remove it herbicides or, or use herbicides with it. Um, it. It's really common in shady areas. So in spaces where grass, if we're talking about a lawn, doesn't grow very well, you might see a lot of this. Um, and it also can indicate you might have a low pH. It kind of likes the soil to be a little on the acidic side. Um, it, it's a little hardier, so the grasses that are pickier or the plants that are pickier about their soil pH don't grow as well, which leaves a bare open spot for this plant to grow. Um, I did not know this, that it was, it's used as a flavoring for home brewing. So that's an interesting fact. And this is one that people will also use um, with medicinal properties. And um, this is Japanese stiltgrass. This is one of the worst weeds of the day. Um, this is a summer annual, and this is very invasive and very, very hard to control. Um, there's lots of different measures you can use. Herbicides are, are pretty recommended if you have a huge infestation like you see here. Um, I wouldn't try to hand remove this Maybe if you paid me, I would, but I, I wouldn't want to try to hand remove this. Mulching it, also a good way. You're smothering out the weeds. Um, you're cooking the seed bank underneath it, um, helping to, to really keep it, keep it at bay. Um, this one also might be and one that you need to really sit down and look at your soil pH. What's the issue there? Do you have low soil pH? Is, is that why it's taken hold so much? Again, might not always be the issue, but it's always worth looking into, especially since soil testing is free through, through WVU. Um, this one can be mistaken for a few other grasses. One way to tell the difference is, I'm gonna draw on here. On the Japanese silk grass, you'll see on the leaves, it's got a, like a little silver vein right down the middle of the leaf. Um, that's 
kind of an indication that it's still grass and not a different type of weed that we'll, we'll get into. It might be on the next slide. No, it's not. And ugh, my thing didn't save this afternoon. Johnson grass is another summer annual. Um, I'll save that before sending these slides out. Uh, this is another one that's really, really hardy. Um, it's really common in, in hay fields along the side of the road. Um, it's common in these areas because when you're, we, most of our grasses are cool season grasses, meaning they grow best in the springtime and in the fall. So after we take the first cutting of hay off, um, the grass growth is not as high. Um, it, it doesn't grow as fast, but, and the grass doesn't grow as tall as quickly either, but the Johnson grass does. So that's the Johnson grass time to shine. There's herbicides that are out there to control Johnson grass as well. Um, in a garden setting, this isn't super difficult to hand pull. It's not like the greatest, but um, if you have a, just a few plants here and there, it, it's, it's not that difficult. Lamb's quarter, one we probably all see in our garden setting. This is a summer annual. Um, there are herbicides to control it. Personally, I don't think that's necessary. And anything that I see pop up in the garden, they have a really shallow root system, so they pull up super, super easily. Um, but again, if you see some of this, maybe you want to find another use for it. People will use it for medicinal uses, and we'll also use it as a type of vegetable, like an, in a salad green. Nimble well. This is the one that can be easily mistaken for Japanese stilt grass. It's another warm season grass. Um, you might see both of them in the same turf. So just because you're having trouble identifying doesn't necessarily mean that you only have one, you might have both. Um, nimble well usually indicates that you don't have the greatest soil fertility, um, or maybe you just have bare spots in the lawn or the area. So maintaining a desirable species, you can trade it with herbicides as well. And, and again, checking your soil. Um, we had a grower that had a, a big problem with this, uh, took some soil tests and found his pH was pretty low. So that's definitely not helping the issue any. Pigweed, this one, a little bit more common in row crops, but still present in the home setting. Uh, it's a summer annual, herbicides, mulching, hand removal, all easy things to control. Um, usually you don't see an infestation of this in the home setting, but usually not by the time it gets to this point. Um, it's a little harder to hand pull, but not impossible. So you notice the central theme here with weed control, mulching, using straw, you can use newspaper, cardboard, anything that's gonna biodegrade um, or black plastic mulches um, might be a little less work up front, but something that can be reused and you can count on it. Um, if you're leaving your garden space bare every year after the garden ends, you might wanna consider a cover crop. Making sure you have a coverage on the garden space will ensure that you're just not leaving an open space for the weeds to poke through. Some of these things start growing in the fall, so your garden might be put to bed. So you could even put a layer of um, shredded leaves on top of the garden. Anything that's keeping the soil covered will also help prevent erosion, keep all that good soil fertility in there, increase organic matter, and has the added benefit of reducing weed, weed pressure. pressure. Excuse me. And there's always the old fashioned ways of pulling it, digging it, mowing it up. Um, hoeing it up is backbreaking work. So when you get into um, a lot of pressure, like in a new garden space, you might have a lot in the seed bed, um, especially after you till up, that's just waiting to come through, like my nemesis, crabgrass. Mulching is probably going to be your best way. Chemical control also, always a viable option when done responsibly. So if you consider chemical controls, you need to read the label because the label is the law. Using a chemical in a way that is not recommended by the label is breaking the law. And that includes proper storage of it and proper disposal. Many of these you can't just throw in the trash. If you're not gonna use the whole thing, um, the label will usually tell you, usually it says something generic like contact your solid waste authority. Well, you call the solid waste authority and they say, we don't take herbicides. Um, if it's still with and it's, if it's not an old chemical, you know, saying if you have a neighbor that can get use out of it or somebody else. So it's not going waste, um, going to waste. 
Empty containers usually can be thrown in the trash. But again, the label will tell you all of that information. A few specific types of pesticide, especially if you're kind of opposed to using chemicals, which again is perfectly fine. Ones that are more commonly used um, and are known not to have a lot of harmful side effects, especially to pollinators. I know that's a great concern to many people and justifiably so. Um, neem oil, I mentioned a couple times, is one that will coat the plant and keep the insect from feeding on the leaf, basically, and removing its, its source of food. And some sources, in some cases, it will, like with spider mites, those really tiny ones, it'll, it'll um, also kind of smother the plant as well. Um, a bacillus, I'm not even gonna act like I'm gonna pronounce this correctly, but I'll give it a shot. Bacillus thuringiaceae, BT is what we call it. This is one that's commonly used for worms, cabbage loopers, bagworms, um, anything else that might be harmful to your plants that's a worm is usually controlled with this. Um, at a certain point in time, around the time the forsythias bloom, early May, when you're still in that, that, that smaller life cycle. And again, it depends on the plant, which we can help you diagnose that as well. And insecticidal soap um, can be used on things like Japanese beetles, people will drown in that. And there's a few other species as well that are kind of, it's kind of a low impact way. Um, we always get the question on which types of pesticides can be damaging to bees. Those that might have active ingredient labels, carbol, um, pym um, permethrin, um, some of the other ones lists that are here, they go by different trade names. On the label, you always want to look, it's usually right in front of the label, but it's usually tiny print on what is the active ingredient, what percentage is it the active ingredient. But in the label, the, the label will also tell you if that could be damaging to pollinators. Some of those chemicals might tell you it's best to spray um, after the plants are pollinated, it's best to spray at night. Um, and it just really heavily depends on the concentration, on the type, and a lot of other factors. So reading the label is law. It's the best way to ensure you're doing it responsibly, you're doing it correctly in a way that doesn't compromise your gardening practices as well. So again, it will say what it can be used for, um, where the product can be used, or how to apply, how much to use, when, how often. Um, and another important one is when you can use the crop after application. So if you're putting neem oil on the leaves of spinach, I think you have to wait seven days as the advised time to, to harvest that and eat that crop. If you're using it in a large concentration, you might not be able to re-enter a treated area. Or if you have livestock, it might advise when you can put your livestock back on. Again, all of those things very extremely heavily dependent on the type of chemical. And it also mentioned how to store it and how to dispose of it properly. Just as a um, example of not great chemical communication, um, a individual bought this property, the prior owners, this is no fault of, of, the, of the current owner, the prior owners had used their sprayer for, um, I think they pro probably had um, a Roundup in it or something within that, with that active ingredient. And they didn't clean the sprayer properly. And when the new owners bought the place and bought the equipment, they didn't communicate that to the new owners. So then they ended up using it, the sprayer to, to, to spray the orchard and ended up spraying Roundup on, on the orchard. Um, again, no, no fault of this, the, the current owner, um, and, and it, it was an example of poor record keeping um, that could have easily been rectified. Um, these, these apple trees are going to be just fine, um, but they did kind of suffer on a, on a gap year because it just it killed the leaves on the plant. Um, might, might stunt the growth just a little bit, but they, they'll recover in a couple, this was several years ago, so they're doing just fine right now, but 
again, that's kind of an example of, of how things can go wrong. It's always really good practice if you're using chemicals to, to make, keep a record of it, where you, where you applied it, where you applied it on. And that just kind of helps you remember, oh, it was seven days ago, I can go in and harvest that now. So the best control for any type of garden pest, when I say pest, I mean a disease. It could be an actual insect or it could be a weed. Um, trying to eliminate space for, for it to pop up or whether it's popping up in the form of a plant or coming in the form of disease. Leaving plenty of space between plants. Your seed packet will tell you what's the proper spacing. Follow that because that's ensuring that when your plants get to their biggest and brightest potential, you still have enough airflow between one and the next plant that you're not gonna have any fungal issues. Removing those weeds, because they can be a host to diseases or undesirable insects, and removing any dead or diseased plants as soon as you can. Um, the best way to do any of that is checking your garden daily, checking it as regularly as possible. So you can notice when things are, are not looking like they should be, and you can take action as soon as possible. So always remember some plants are easier to care for others. Some years are better to care for certain plants than others. Sometimes you have a failure. Sometimes you have things flourish it. But gardening is all about learning from your experiences and doing something that benefits you for your health and for your family. So there's one more in the chat. Stefan asked about cover crops. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of different varieties of cover crops. Um, that is a really great question. So um, I was working with a grower over the winter months. Um, he wanted to put a cover crop um, in his high tunnel. He put one in and he used clover just because when um, you kill clover, when, when it terminates, since it's a legume, it fixates nitrogen into the soil. So he killed it by just when he's getting ready to plant now. So a couple weeks ago, he um, smothered it in black plastic. So then he's gonna plant directly into the plastic. All of that cover is going to die because it's, it's getting smothered by the plastic, by the mulch. And then as it degrades, it's gonna put that nitrogen into the soil. So you can use something just like a clover um, especially if you know you're kind of low in nutrients. Um, you can use a mixture like a hairy vetch and a ryegrass. Some people use oats. Some people use wheat. Um, anything that is good growing in the fall is going to be if that's when you're planting it. So you, you want to plant it at a time um, early to mid-October is best. Sometimes you can get away with going a little bit later, but you're, you're really playing with mother nature there. Um, because you're making sure that that cover crop gets a good enough growth on it, you know, a few inches before it stops growing. And then um, in the springtime, you can either till it in and the residue will break down. You can either just put a mulch directly on top of it and the residue will break down, whatever, whatever works for your garden. And then you have the added benefit of adding organic matter naturally into your soil for the next gardening season and keeping it covered. Um, when it's not in use. Yes, Mary, um, we, we've been, I'll check on your, your email just to make sure. Um, we did, we have sent out the, the past however many weeks we've done um, the recordings and the um, The recordings and the passcodes for other ones, um, but I'll, I'll make sure that you're getting those. Um, Teresa asked, what is the life cycle of the cicadas? The cicadas will probably come in late May and they should be here for about six weeks. Um, I, I can't say that I've heard on any advice on to delay planting, um, but I'm happy to look into that for you. And John, I am not familiar with burnout. Um, he, he does mention it's a natural weed killer. It contains citrus acid and clove oil. Um, if it's a registered use you, pesticide, you sh it should have those recommendations on the label on what it can be used on and what it can be used around. But I'll look into that for you and get you an answer. And
Paula, um, are you asking if garlic would be good as a cover crop? Because yes, I, I believe that would be great. Um, anything that is going to overwinter, again, you have the, the main purpose is you have the added benefit of keeping the soil covered. That's the main purpose of a cover crop. So you're just utilizing your space to its fullest potential. So that's, that's a very um, good, good solution for especially for a small, a small space. All right. If there's no other questions, um, thank you guys for participating tonight. We'll, we'll have the recording available and I hope that you have, will join us for the following week. Um, late harvest for garlic. So Paula, I, I don't have a whole lot of information or experience with garlic. I know the growers around here that grow it, eh, usually harvesting it for farmers markets in April. It's one of the first crops. Um, so Worst case scenario, you might have a little bit of a later planting with some of your other crops. Um, but again, it's your garden, so um, that does come with the benefit of working around some of the, the pests and disease cycles as well. Thank you, everybody. Paul, thank you for those kind words as well. Um, Have a great evening, everyone, and I hope to see you next week for composting. Composting is one of my favorite topics, and we have great presenters that will be here for that one.